I'm very excited to present our three speakers today from BBC Media Action, previously known as the BBC World Service Trust. And they have wonderfully and admirably, admirably, admirably put a serious focus on research and learning with respect to their international development programs around the world. So today we'll be hearing from Kavita Abraham Dowsing, the Director of Research and Learning, Anna Godfrey, the Head of Research Programs, and Zoe Fortune, a Senior Research Manager in charge of monitoring and evaluation. We're thrilled to have them here, to hear about their work, uh, to hear how they are integrating research and learning into their development programs, and how we at Penn might be able to work with them to help advance that research and learning with regard to the role of media in international development. And with that, I will leave it to you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Lauren. Um, just to say I arrived late last night on a flight from London, but I'm very, very happy to be here today. It's a, it's a meeting we've been planning for over a year. I'm very grateful to be invited by the CGCS to come and share some of the work that we're doing and learn a lot, and we hope to have a lot of discussion as part of this session. Also very pleased that we've been able to get some of our friends, old and new, from the other side of the US, also able to come and listen from USC, so thank you guys for coming over and making the time um, and managing with our scheduling. So we're really excited to be here, and most of all, thank you for those of you who've given up your lunch time to come and hear a little bit about what we do. My only sadness and regret this morning is we probably will never be able to invite any of you back to the BBC because the quality of the lunch that we provide is nowhere near the standard of the salmon and other lovely things that you have done here. So let me start uh, with uh, explaining who we are and what we do. As Lauren said, we are the international development charity. Uh, we are of the BBC. We share their values, their ambitions, their um, brand. But we are an independent charity. We do not get any funding from the BBC. We get some office space, but all of, we are 98% project funded. So we are accountable financially to the donors and the international development donor community. So just so you know how we position ourselves. We are um, the BBC Media Action, which was the World Service Trust, was established in 1999. So we're a relatively young organization. We're about 15 years old. And research and learning within BBC Media Action is about nine years old. So we were established in 2005. And we have, um, at that time, there were three people who were called research and learning within a small organization. Today, we are about 100 researchers across 27 countries in the globe, looking, working, working in the field, trying to understand how media works, how media works in the particular areas we're interested in, how we can make better programs, and how we can achieve development outcomes in a slightly more uh, results-driven way. So the case to build the need for this research and learning team is, a, is, is an old, is, is, is sort of the first four or five years of research and learning within BBC Media Action. Uh, the, it, was, it was the ambition of, of that director who we, we, we think of as our founder and some colleagues here know him. His name is Jerry Powers spent a lot of time building the case for research within BBC Media Action, and I think it's fair to say we're unusually a large team. Um, we, are, we are unusually a large team for, for two reasons. One, because we must work to inform our programs. BB, the BBC, one of our values is audiences are at the heart of everything we do, so we have a whole branch of our group which works on informing programs, and then we have an evaluative arm, but let me tell you a little bit more about that in a moment. In um, 2011, we also won something called the Global Grant. So we were awarded by the British government, the Department for International Development, a, a strategic grant, which we refer to as the Global Grant. And a lot of the presentation you're going to hear today, particularly from Zoe, will be around the research we are now able to do because of the Global Grant. And the Global Grant really has allowed us in research to double in size. 
So we are, uh, in the last two, three years, we are, we are double what we used to be. And a lot of the interesting opportunities we have for learning, for evidence, and for partnership, which is the focus of this presentation, comes out of the benefit of the Global Grant. One of our challenges in being all things to many people is that we need to serve multiple audiences. And I'm just going to give you a flavor of that, if somebody might help me with the technology. I need to get out of the slides here <laughs> to show you a little film about the multiple audiences that we're trying to serve. Research is so important for media action because we receive money to do work in countries which is designed to bring about change. And we have to be able to demonstrate the impact. So we have to be able to demonstrate that the spend is value for money. Our researchers are absolutely key to our teams. They provide us with audience insights. They provide us with feedback once the programs or the content has, has uh, reached the audience. And that enables us to change and to be more relevant and more effective. The most important part of our work is to understand our listeners. Today we are here to talk to these young people about some of the governance issues they have in this community. Then we get this feedback, put it together, and talk to our producers so that we are able to design a governance program that really resonates with what the people in this community feel is of a priority. We've done formative research, really talking to people, using lots of different qualitative methods of gathering insights about the audiences that we're working with. If we had done this without the research, it wouldn't have resounded with audiences, they wouldn't have used the service, it would have just completely and utterly failed. Now I think we're getting to the stage of actually translating our impact into evidence. We've got really good data. We've got really good people who can make sense of that data and we can then start writing it up in a form that are credible to certainly an international policy audience and then beginning to get to the standards of, a, of an international academic audience and research audience as well. The research briefing we produced on Saja Sawal, which is our major public debate program in Nepal, which was really using a regression analysis effectively, really looking, probing the data that we have on whether this program, this intervention, did actually increase political knowledge, political efficacy, um, uh, political participation. And yes, it did. We, we, we demonstrated that there was a, a, a significant association there. We've got an extraordinary opportunity now with the kind of a scale of operation we have in the research and learning team, the quality of the people we've got, the kind of resourcing we're beginning to get to, to really make a major contribution to um, the evidence base externally to international debates, research debates, policy debates, practitioner debates, actually to start raising the standard of the field uh, as an organization that takes learning seriously. Great. So how do we, how do, we do this? So uh, we, you saw a couple of our audiences there. We have the, the head of our programs. We have the director of our policy saying very different things and a different set of expectations being laid over the research and learning team. We like to think of ourselves as doing three, having three pillars to which we work. We have the first pillar, which is the pillar which the uh, director of programs, Caroline Howey, was talking to was informing programs. So a part of our research is about finding out where our audiences are on the issues we want to cover, what is the language they're using, what are the social norms they're thinking about, what are the conceptualizations they have, how do we articulate in everyday language the very complex issues we're trying to communicate. The second pillar that we work to is the evaluation pillar. This is our pillar of accountability. This is the pillar which we have to say to a donor, this is how we have used your money. This is the impact that you have required of us to, us to achieve, and this is how we have achieved it. So that's the, pill, the, the, the broadest pillar you see in the middle. And right on the end, we have a sort of a narrow pillar, which th this is the new pillar we have, which is a benefit coming out of the Global Grant, which is the pillar of creating evidence. And this is what James Dean, our director of policy, was talking about, which is really trying to engage with academic audiences, with people who spend more time thinking about the conceptualization of this work, what would work, what wouldn't work, using more rigorous uh, research methodologies, 
trying some things out with colleagues in Annenberg, which we did last year, which we'll share with you sh further on, but really trying to be more robust than, um, than we would have been traditionally just to provide, inform, and evaluate. So I'm just going to quickly show you one more little clip of how the research to inform element works. So you get a sense of what this looks like in country. Before I start this, I should probably say this is, um, the of this is our Nairobi office. One of the big programs that we are producing at the moment is a debate show, a, fa a debate show called Sema Kenya, which means Talk Kenya. It is a debate where uh, people, are audi it's an audience-led debate, so the audiences arrive, they write the questions that they would like to be answered. It's, these are posed by an independent moderator to the politicians, the people on the panel, the people in charge who are making decisions for them. And then the people in authority are required to answer the people who are sitting in front of them directly. So it's a, it is a format which you may be familiar with, but this is what happens weekly in the production room before the program starts. And we also have Angela from Angela. Research and Learning. <laughs> I just wanted to give you a bit of feedback. I am the research manager for BBC Media Action in East Africa. We traveled around the country to the eight provinces and we talked to people about the issues and the problems uh, and the concerns that they and have. I've said this before, really, really positive feedback. People are so, so excited about being given a chance to ask their leaders questions. It's what fun. we did is we came up with temperature maps. This is then used on a weekly basis by program researchers from which they can then do further research. I've never been on a focus group where they tell me we didn't need to talk about this. The work that we do, it just drives the whole process forward and it makes the work that we do here in BBC Media Action relevant and effective. Okay, so I'm... Um in Media Action, before I tell you a little bit more about the temperature maps, we work in three main areas. Our programming is either in the area of governance, governance-related issues. We also work in the area of health, so maternal child health, HIV, AIDS, those kind of topics. We also work, our third stream of work is in the work of humanitarian resilience, working with disaster risk reduction, uh, life light and preparedness, and other areas within the, the, the theme of resilience. So you will keep, we'll keep coming back to work which might look quite different, but just to frame it to know that there are these three areas of work. Coming back to Sema Kenya, which is a governance program, this is the temperature, kind of temperature map which Angela was talking about. A big part of our research and where our research begins with any program is before the programming starts. So the first activity within any program project sheet you will see is research. We go out to the country, countryside, we go to different parts of the audience, we segment the audience, and then we try to find out what does somebody living in the, in the south of um, Kenya understand by the term governance. Very often we won't use the word governance. We will use different qualitative methodologies, peer review techniques, community assessments to get people to articulate their lived experiences of what are sometimes quite complex theoretical constructs which we want to then pull together ultimately for the evaluation. So here, they, they, you can see the temperature map that they've created for Sema Kenya and this, these are really, really helpful for the production teams. So as the program travels around the country, the production team will keep going back to the temperature maps to re refer to what are the key issues that people were concerned about and if we look at the area in the south, the red, which is the, the largest um, bubble if you like, was about the high cost of living. So that was, there, were, there were a number of questions there which the uh, uh, audiences wanted to address. You had then had the issue of poverty, which was yellow, and so on and so forth. And these documents tend to remain live as the program goes into second series, third series, and it serves as quite a good reference point. This is a, a, what an audience group for Sema Kenya looks like. This is the live audience. There are, of course, the audiences that we're reaching over the broadcast network, and this is what our broadcast audience looks like. So we are now producing audience profiles, which is probably not new for many who come from commercial research, but it's very interesting for us in development to be able to understand our audiences to this level. 
If I just quickly point out a few highlights here from our audience profile, again, something that the production teams really like. They like to know what percentage of women they're reaching in comparison to the total population split. So the answer to that question would be 44% versus 51%. So there may be some shows which are more women-focused. Women and girls is a big area. We may maybe want to work, work on that. They want to know what the rural and urban split is. So are they really reaching rural audiences? Are we really getting to the hard to reach audiences? And here you can see 63% to 64 in the country. So that's fairly good. On the education and income, just to do the short version of this, this looks, it, it looks like it if you, it, that it looks like on education that people are highly educated in the Semakenya audience. The 44% group is really the group who have completed secondary school. So, and you can see the audience is in line with the population of Kenya at the moment. That may not always be something that the production team wants. The pro production team may be wanting to work with the illiterate. They may be wanting to work with the poor, poorer in the communities. But this kind of information helps them know where they are so they can target programs differently. And similarly, with income, where, where we're peaking at 43% is people who can buy food and clothes but can't afford a car. So it's the purchasing power parity, which Zoe can talk to you a little bit more. I'm going to hand over to Zoe now because she is the senior research manager in charge of the Global Grant, so she knows all the details of the ins and outs, and she's going to share a little bit more about that project with you. Thank you, Kavita. Um, yes, the Global Grant. So what is it? It's our research project across 14 countries in which we work. Uh, three thematic areas, that's governance, health, and resilience, and humanitarian response. And we are in two, year two of a five-year grant at the moment. We've just gone through an annual review process, and I'll show you a film in a moment which really kind of highlights some of the output that we're producing just to give you a flavour of what we're doing under the grant. And then I'll talk a little bit more about how we plan to, to really understand the impact that we are having. And really the opportunity of the grant has allowed us to look across the piece, look across the thematic work that we're doing, and not just at an individual country level. So if I can just go to the film that we have. We do like our films. Um, oh. Working in 15 countries, broadcasting in 18 languages. But Madam, what is this? My kids are here. They are here. They are here. They are here. They are here. The reach of governance and accountability programming has more than doubled to 109 million people. In March, President Karzai agreed to appear on Open Jirga. Nobody expected what happened next. As a result of this question, the government of Afghanistan now has a disability advisor in every one of its ministries. Debate programs giving ordinary people the chance to ask direct questions of their leaders have been running in eight countries. It was really interesting to see the leaders, especially the politicians, coming to the ground and meeting the local people and people can ask questions straight. When asked, do you think this program plays a role in holding government to account, 62% agreed, a further 29% strongly agreed. 91% agree the programs are achieving this key aim. On the island of Shabro in Sierra Leone, because it is so isolated, people can lack access to information. So I help train volunteers who run a local radio station. I train a blind man to host his own show. How to bring people together, now, how to interview people. So many things. We're building capacity with 84 partners, 
including 72 local and national broadcasters. So in the past, we have to work as a government, government mouthpiece. After previously banning the BBC, the Burmese government invited us in to work with the state broadcaster. We start cooperation with the BBC Media Action, and after that, we start changing. Improving MRTV news output ahead of elections in two years' time. Programming has supported free and fair elections in four countries. <laughs> In Sierra Leone, as a commitment to peaceful elections, two local party leaders sat together for the first time. I just want to assure the lady, the APC party, we know the condom violence. I really want to repeat here, say, the SLPP not to a party. That's quite a majority. As the loudspeakers blared out ahead of the cyclone, it was a desperate evacuation. Within 48 hours and before the cyclone hit land, we created a public service announcement informing people what to do when a cyclone hits. It was adopted by the government of Bangladesh and broadcast nationally. This program, Mr. Jenya and Jember, are focused on health of mothers and children and their babies. We try to connect with the real life of the rural people. <laughs> You really understand communication. I don't think the health sector really does that. Sharing what we've learned with the wider sector. The BBC has the important role of almost being the gold standard. The question is, does sending information through mobiles alone bring about meaningful change in very poor communities? I think the mobile is now at the stage where people realise its power but are trying to evaluate ways it works best. Okay, so I hope that gave you a little bit of a flavour of the type of output that we produce under each of the themes. And really it's around uh, our job in research and learning is to understand, to in inform the programmes and to also understand the impact that we are having. So within our research strategy we really have four key questions that we'd like to know the answers to at the end of our five years. The first of which is who are the relevant target audiences for media action global grant interventions and the key needs of those audiences. And that's really where our research to inform comes in. You heard from Angela earlier talking about that. And that's also around which are the most effective platforms and communication methods for engaging and influencing identified groups. So as mentioned there, we, some of our outputs is around drama, some of our outputs are PSAs, and then we also have factual debate programs as well and lots of other variety of outputs. And then there's also who are the key predict what are the key predictors of intended outcomes for our audiences and how effective are our media communications in impacting these key outcomes and the predictors of those outcomes. And I'll come on to talk a little bit more about that in a moment. But we would like to understand the answers to these questions at the end of five years. And what we tried to do is to break down these questions under each of the three themes as well. So how do we go about doing that? The first, I suppose the first challenge we have is we have a single log frame. So this logical framework is the monitoring and reporting tool to our funders. 
And this is, a, this is one tool by which we have to get all of our outputs and everything that we produce under every country into one results table, if you like. And what you can see here is we have everything broken down by impact outcome and our output. So our impact, for example, under our governance work, is really around more accountable state-society relations. And we, how do we report to this log frame? We have several different ways in which we measure, but to report to the log frame, it's really a self-report mechanism and it's a self-attribution to the program. That's just one of the ways we're getting an impact, and I'll talk a little bit further about how we do exposed versus non-exposed later. But under governance, it's really we're looking at the percentage of people reached through factual programming who believe the intervention's playing a role in holding the government to account. And then we also have our outcome indicators and we have our output, that's the number of people reached. And so one of the key challenges that we face is around understanding our programs and getting all of that information into the one log frame. So how do we do that and how do we go about evaluating? The first thing that we try and do is to really understand the literature, which I'm sure everyone here is very familiar with. And then we work very closely with our country teams to try and understand what that means for each individual country. So if I just show you one of the conceptual models that our advisory and policy department have created for our health work, it's a little bit of a busy slide, but I hope you can see. It approximately follows media and communication activities, the influence of media and communication, and the red stars are things that we are actually measuring in our quantitative surveys and in our qualitative work as well. So we are measuring knowledge, attitudes and beliefs, self-efficacy, confidence and agency, descriptive and injunctive norms, and then dialogue and communication. This should lead to healthy behaviour, supportive social norms, leading to healthier populations. And this is really our overall framework for how we do our health work, and we have each of these for governance and resilience as well. And then we break this down for each individual country and work very closely with a, the with a country to understand what is their theory of change, how does that work in that particular environment, what are you actually trying to, to do, what are your communication objectives, and how can we go about measuring that. So where do we take it from there? We then look at what are the standard objectives and indicators and the bespoke ones as well. So what are the objectives and indicators that are relevant across all of the countries in which we work? So our governance work is across 11 countries. Our health work is across four. And what are the standard objectives that we can look at across each of those so that we can aggregate together? And that's a key aim of the grant is to aggregate across those countries. And then we also look at the bespoke objectives for the individual countries as well. What are the individual communication objectives? How can we measure those? And we do a lot of work at the level of the audience. So I'll talk about our quantitative surveys in a moment, but really it's, it's a real focus on what's the impact on our audience. And then we also try and understand uh, the level of the practitioner and the organization and the systems level work as well. And we do that through a variety of means. So if I just say a little bit more about how we do our quantitative surveys. So our quantitative surveys are standardised for 40% of our questions across governance, 40% across health, and then the same for our resilience and humanitarian response. And they measure different constructs. So for example, in our governance work, we're aiming to measure political efficacy, collective efficacy, knowledge, discursive, civic and political participation, individual empowerment, etc. So those are the kind of uh, constructs that we are measuring across every country. And then we also have 40% country-specific questions that we might like to know that are particularly relevant to that context. So the common questions we can aggregate, the country-specifics are really trying to understand the nuanced environment. And then we also have our 20% demographics in there as well. And then the, we have that broken down for health and for resilience, as you can see. So that's really our quantitative survey work, and we do that across baseline, midline, and endline as well, usually at three time points, but there is a little bit of fluctuation in that. And the nice thing about the grant is it enables us to have a little bit of fluctuation in our research methodology. So what we're also trying to do is adopt very much a mixed methods approach. So we have pre-testing of all of our outputs, and that continues throughout the entire duration of the grant as well. Quantitative surveys, 
And then we also have focus groups, in-depth interviews, um, and then expert panel interviews with local media and governance experts in the country to try and understand the environment in which we're working, the media environment, and the context in which our work is placed. And then for health, we, we do something similar, but it's very much, for example, we'll do health centre assessments, community assessments, we are trying projective research techniques. And one thing that we've faced a challenge is, is around measurement of certain constructs. So, for example, in our health work, we found that measurement of social norms and particular things like that can be a challenge. And so it's really using a triangulation of many different methods to try and get at our impact in many different ways. And then under our resilience work, this is really just coming on board. So we started very much off with our governance, health has come on board, and now we're, we're starting with our resilience as well. And we've used the Climate Asia data portal, which I'll come on to talk about in a second, to really inform that. Um, so really, when we're talking about evaluating our impact, it's using our baseline, midline, and endline surveys. We are reporting to the log frame, so we're using our self-attribution measure. But we're also trying to look at the difference between exposed and non-exposed and levels of exposure to our programs as well. So we are trying to go a little bit further beyond that with our data and then also triangulate with our qualitative measures, our health centre assessments, and also looking to see where we can partner with other NGOs on the ground when other other data that we have to really try and understand the impact that we're having. So... This really is a little bit complicated, but this is just to show the schedule of our work. So this is across output one and output two, and the kind of turquoise color lines are where we are on air. And the point really is just to show that the, well, the red parts are where we have quantitative surveys. So this is a constantly moving target as our on-air dates shift, but it's really a bit of a juggle as to when's best to survey. And it's trying to fit in with production and production timelines and, and when is best to measure to feed into production teams as well. So then moving on to output three in our work under humanitarian response and resilience, what we've done is we've taken interviews from 33,500 respondents across seven countries across Asia, which was completed last year, and we've put that into a data portal, and we've put the numbers behind the interface, if you like, so we've actually got five million data points into um, some software, and this comes out in a data portal, which I will show you a clip of rather than me clicking through. Okay, so what you've got, if you go to the data portal, you click on a country, and then you select your topic of interest, and within that we've got each of the questions broken down, and then you can break it down even further, and then you can choose which way you want to disaggregate by up to two variables, so you could look at, for example, um, gender, age, etc. So in this case it's location. And then you can also have it by tables as well. And what we found about this, this has taken a, it's taken a large amount of time and resource. But what's been really great about this is that we've been able to aggregate our data together across all of these seven countries and put it together. We've also, uh, we've also created communication toolkits, things like that. I'll come on to that in a moment. Um, and this really shows our data across each of the countries. And we've also done regional profiling as well. So we've done a cluster analysis across each of the seven countries to look at the... Um, we've come out with um, five different types of respondents, if you like. We've got those who are surviving, and that means finding it hard to take action. Struggling trying to take action but finding it difficult. Those who are adapting, and that's really acting and wanting to do more. Um, willing, worrying about tomorrow. And unaffected, those who believe that there is no need to do anything about climate change. And the key thing about Climate Asia work is really it's understanding the audience's perceptions of climate change and what they are perceiving is going on. So then what we've also done within the Climate Asia data portal, so you can go through and you can click through each of the questions from all of the surveys, and you can break it down whichever way you like. And then we've also produced country reports, 
regional reports, and we've also produced a communication toolkit as well, which the, it's really designed to help other agencies and other communication agencies to produce programming around climate change. And then one of the other things that we're also doing under this output is really reaching out to, to other networks to, um, to bring together. Um, and what we've done is um, we've worked with the CDAC network, which is communicating with disaster-affected communities. And I will now hand over to Anna to really talk about how we're working with other partnerships. Thanks, Zoe. So the idea of Climate Asia was really to try and give information about audiences to so those people charged with communicating on climate change, recognising that climate change adaptation responses in Asia are often um, having to work with communities on the ground, but many of those um, NGOs, local NGOs, do not have information around those audiences. So it's trying to give them a better information about those audiences in order to adapt their communication. Um, the reason we launched the data portal was really to try and get that information and data accessible to NGOs who are working in uh, the Global South. The, another area of our work under resilience is our work with CDAC. CDAC is um, a network of media development and humanitarian organisations. And it was formed in about 2010, and it was a, partly in recognition of a policy briefing that um, our organisation produced called Left in the Dark, which was actually identifying that often in humanitarian responses, information is a humanitarian deliverable in the same way shelter um, and other things can be. So this network recognised that there was a gap in two-way communications with audiences in disasters. And um, this network is now working to try and think about how communications can be um, integrated into disaster responses. Um, for us, it's been really exciting because it means that we can work, we're part of that network and we're also been working with the UN sector um, and trying to see about how information uh, needs assessments can be integrated into responses. There's also a recognition that how, when information communication has been used, there's very little awareness of whether it's been effective or not. So there's a growing demand for more impact evaluation or appropriate impact evaluation in that sector, recognising conducting research in a disaster is very challenging. That was an example of some of the work we're trying to do in partnership. Working in partnership is a key part of our work. And one of the, um, for those who've known us for a while, one of the ongoing criticisms of us as an organization is you're sitting on a lot of data. You're sitting on a lot of learning. But you're not getting it out there. You're not sharing it. Um, part of that was just time. We're spending a lot of time working with our production teams and don't have the time to write that information up. So that's why in the past we've formed um, some quite neat partnerships with academics to try and get that data out there. We, as part of this global grant, we put a huge emphasis on aggregating our data and learnings. So if we're working on governance projects across a number of countries, can we aggregate what we're learning to help people who are thinking about uh, work using media and communication to support governance uh, objectives in the developing world? So a large part of what we're trying to do under the Global Grant, and we're just starting this, is working more on disseminating our research. And we've got a uh, particular dissemination series that's called Bridging Theory and Practice. Huge, huge ambition there. But really what it is about is recognising that we need to really inform practice, but there's some really great theory out there, and how much of the practitioner is really aware of that and drawing on that to inform that what they're doing. So we've launched a bridging the theory and practice process. And on the left-hand side, the kind of less glossy uh, publications are our working papers. We're trying to get our research out there. And we're trying to get feedback on our research. Um, and so for each working paper we produce, we go through a three-month consultation process. And we welcome and invite feedback. And then we... Um, review that feedback and try to then publish it in two formats, the long detailed reports that our donors and researchers community like, but also very short four to six page summaries of what we're learning, which a very bu busy policymaker would pick up, the, pick up and, and hopefully read. So these are some examples of our recent publications. I mentioned a little bit, I touched on how we've worked with academia. Um, in the past, it's been pretty ad hoc. It's often driven by us saying, oh, we'd really like you to come and help us work on this, and often built on relationships. 
Um, going forward, we really want to have more strategic, we want to continue those types, but also thinking about having strategic relationships. Um, and we want it to be driven not just by our practice, but also by the, the theory as well. And we hope by increasingly sharing our data, which is an ambition for us, and also a, an imperative for our funders. Increasingly in the UK, any research that's in, conducted and funded by that's funded by DFID, the UK Department for International, there's an imperative that after a period of time, that data should be in the public domain. And so, therefore, we are trying to honour those commitments and get more of our data into the public domain. I wanted to touch on a little bit about um, research partnerships and innovation. We, within UK uh, international development broadly, and also particularly in the UK, there's a, a lot of... Uh, intense debate about what constitutes evidence. And there is an increasing demand, especially amongst our key, one of our key donors, uh, DFID, for greater evidence of impact in international development. This concerns a lot of international development has been, uh, hasn't been evidence-based and hasn't had much impact evaluation. And as a result, there is uh, increasing d demand and appetite for more learning and less working on, if you like, blind faith. Um, and so one of the things that we've been trying to do is understand those debates. There's some, being, uh, some interesting uh, discussions hosted by Oxfam, actually, the direct, their uh, director of strategy, um, Graham Green, or a strategic advisor, I should say, Graham Green, Duncan Green, sorry, hosted a really interesting debate around the politics of evidence. And it was uh, involved, it was an online debate, and it's, it was called Wonk Wars, um, so have a look at it. But what it effectively had on one side, it had the chief researcher for DFID and the chief economist for DFID. And on the other side, are two academics who have got a, a social anthropology background and worked much more in what I would say the participatory research um, community, discussing the results agenda. And is there an overemphasis on quantifying results? Um, and where is the results agenda going? Is DFID and other uh, donors expecting a lot of randomised controlled trials? How appropriate they, are they for complex interventions? Um, at the end of this debate, there was a vote, and uh, a third of people came down supporting the uh, DFID guys, a third of people came down on the sort of participatory research side, and a third of people said, I have no idea what that debate was about. <laughs> Um, and I think it sort of speaks to a maturing of the international development uh, community and thinking about evidence and uh, impact evaluation and what that really means. But for us, we're really quite excited about that because we've been thinking about this for a long time and in sort of asking many of our donors to fund more of our evaluative work. And so the recognising amongst the donor community that there needs to be more evidence um, is something we very much welcome. <laughs> The other, um, some example, I thought it might be helpful to sort of share some examples of other sort of partnerships we've been taking forward. Um, with the London School of Economics, we have uh, collaborated on a capstone project with some of their master students, and we have effectively shared our data and shared a re research question that we just didn't have the time to answer and look at, which is around how can social media bring value to our governance programming? And so they did a literature review for us, which was really valuable and helpful. Not forgetting that social media in many of the markets we're working in is still is very, very low use of social media, um, with the exception, I suppose, of um, Palestine, where we're working, Palestinian territories. Um, they also then look, we shared our data from Afghanistan and PT, and they did some modeling for us. These types of collaborations are really helpful for us because it helps to move our thinking forward on areas where we just don't have the time to really um, take that data forward. Another example of collaboration is, sorry about ruining your lo um, logo there a little bit with the fonts. Um, we have been recognizing this, have been great interest in the international development community to look at whether and how um, randomised controlled trials and field experiments can be used to understand impact. We have been experimenting with experiments. This has been an area that we haven't historically um, done much research around. And so we actually collaborated with one of your professors, Professor Deborah Mola, on a... We part-supported a uh, field experiment she was undertaking in Ghana. Now, that's outside of the countries we're already working on. But we really wanted to go about working and understanding how she's using that type of methodology to understand media effects and what you can and cannot 
learn and, and from using those methods and approaches. In addition, we also asked Everett to do a review, commissioned Everett to look at a, where field experiments and quasi-experimental methods have been used at the intersection between media development and governance. Today, I should hasten to add, that we have yet to find one of our projects on our governance work where we really feel that we can incorporate a field experiment, um, partly because of the complexity of our theories of change in that in being able to isolate that treatment and exposure. Um, that said, we are, you probably saw when we were showing some films, our work in India, where we're using mobile phones. Um, to support frontline health workers in their communications around uh, maternal and child health and their visits in the village and community. And those mo we're also using mobile phones as a means to provide a service to train frontline health workers as well as a, a service which will actually be available to audiences themselves. On that particular work, we're collaborating at this moment in time with um, 3IE, which is a organization funded by Gates and Diffit, who specialize on trying to bring about more impact evaluation in international development. And we're looking at if and how we can incorporate randomization into the rollout of how the, those mobile phones and those services are being made available to uh, audiences and frontline health workers. Um, we're going through a preparatory stage. We're very aware one of the answers may be the way in which we're working uh, very collaboratively with the Biharan government in, in India it may not be possible to introduce this, uh, this randomization, but we're going to look at it to see if we can. Finally, two other areas of work we're trying to collaborate is we haven't done as much work from the research team around political economy analysis. So we're going to partner with the Overseas Development Institute to look at a political economy analysis around the elections in Tanzania. And what we hope from that partnership is to really identify if, we, if and how we can incorporate political economy analysis considerations into our impact evaluation going forward. So they're going to do a political economy analysis with us, and then they're going to, to feedback the findings and then look at our evaluation program to see if we can take account those considerations into our evaluation. Finally, um, another area we're cl collaborating is on narrative engagement. As many of you will probably know, many of the me media metrics in our sector look at things like reach and regularly reach. Um, but we also know that very complex relationships audiences have, especially with a storytelling formats like our drama, um, is really vital for us to understand if we're going to understand how those types of storytelling drama formats lead to um, behavior change. And so we're collaborating with two academics. One is um, based here in the US, Rick Roussel, um, at Bowling Green State University, to um, to test a narrative engagement scale that he's already developed um, but hasn't tested it in developing countries and we're going to take it to some of our work in Nigeria. And again, we hope that this will really help to understand if and that that thinking can be applied in the developing world context around our drama in Nigeria called Story Story. Over to you, Kavita. In the interest of time, and recognizing that we probably want to hear a lot more from you, what I'm going to do is just skip through the challenges and opportunities, because wouldn't that be a nice thing that we could do, mm -hmm. and introduce you to our research team. That's, uh, um, that's two-thirds of us, about 60 of us at our workshop this year, and say, let's perhaps have a conversation now, a discussion with you about, I guess the, the, the key takeaway messages we wanted to leave with you before we start to, having a conversation together is, we have, a, we have a big data set. We believe that we are not doing justice to that data set. We, we as a sector, we as a group of people who are interested in these issues need to be working much more together with people with different skill sets and helping us move some of the thinking, some of the dialogue, and for us, some of the practice in the sector forward. So we, this is one of the reasons we're out here and going to uh, coming to CGCS and other places to say, come and engage with us, engage with us with the questions, with the data, bring us your ideas that you'd like, if you'd like to work with us using our data on your data like we did with DEVRA. Um, this is really where we are as an organization, realizing that we have the opportunity, we have a shared opportunity as a sector, and let's see then where we can take it from here. <laughs>